to welcome you to New York Ladino Day 2021. Ladino is a variety of Spanish developed among Sephardic Jews in Turkey, the Balkans, and North Africa in the centuries after the Jews were expelled from Spain and Portugal in 1492 and 97. Ladino absorbed words from languages the Jews had contact with, Hebrew, Arabic, Turkish, Greek, Serbo-Croatian, French, and Italian. In the last 15 years, Ladino has seen a great resurgence of interest, and this year's burst of online courses and programs has brought people together from all over to learn to speak, read, and write Ladino. What a wonderful way to start our annual New York Ladino Day with the incredible Ruth Azaria. I'll forego a formal introduction of Ruth because you will get to meet the Sephardic matriarch herself throughout our interview. Ruth, it is yes. such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. Likewise. <laughs> you and I have been meeting in person for a few years now. And yes. this year we will get to meet online and share part of your story with the world. Mashallah. Well, uh, thank you. That's very flattering. Um, I hope the world is ready for it. <laughs> they are, Ruth. So um, just like many conversations or introductions in Ladino begin with the question, Ija de Kensos, why don't we also start in a similar fashion? Tell us about your parents and where they came from, Ruth. Oh, I'm happy to. I love thinking about them. I miss them, and they were wonderful, wonderful parents. My mother was Estirina Esther Pichon, P-I-T-C-H-O-N, was the maiden name. And my and father, father was Albert, Albert Olczyk. Uh, both my parents came from Salonika, Greece. And my mother, uh, I think my mother came uh, in, yes, she said she was uh, 14, so it must have been, she was born in 1901. And so she was, it, this must have been in 1915, in that era, in that time. You are the youngest of two in your family. Tell Correct. us about your sister and your upbringing, your childhood. My first memory was we lived in Harlem and at the top of a staircase from the sidewalk going up. And my grandmother, my father's mother, lived with us. And she was a very kind, loving woman. And I can remember my sister was in, I guess, in day school because I was in a little baby. I don't think she was ready for kindergarten yet, but she was gone for the day, wherever they was. And my parents both worked and I was with my grandmother and my grandmother would sing to me and rock me and take care of me. And those were my first memories, living in that little apartment. My mother was one of five sisters. And we all lived within a few blocks of each other. And we saw each other quite often. The cousins, we all grew up more or less like brothers and sisters, but we were cousins. So I constantly think of them because that was our childhood. That's why I spoke Ladino, because we all spoke the Ladino. We spoke to each other in that language. And of course, my grandmother lived with us for a while. And then she went to live with my aunt and uncle for a while. They, they, they took turns, you know, but it was wonderful. We had wonderful memories of satyrs, beautiful, beautiful satyrs when my grandmother was alive. I never knew my grandfather. He died uh, when I was born as a, as a baby. I was born in 1928. So, and as I said, it was a wonderful, wonderful child. And we all spoke Ladino, all of us. Uh, I grew up in Woodside, Queens, my father and my uncle, my mother's brother, they went into business there in Woodside and the business was right there. They were the wholesale tobacco and confectionery business. And we lived very close by. 
and my aunts and uncle lived in one of them lived in the same building as we did in Woodside in Queens and the others lived in the Bronx and uh, it, you know so it was a subway ride to see them or and of course my father drove so we did see them quite often. And when you think of your childhood, are there any places in particular that come to mind? Yes. Well, in the, in the Bronx, where most of my aunts and uncles lived at this point, we still lived in Woodside. As I said, my, hus- my, hus- my father's business was there. But we spent a lot of time in the Bronx. And there was always, we went to visit the Pasticero, which he was on, I believe, right off the concourse. Jerome, I don't know really what street, but it was off the concourse. And it was, he... I think his last name was Matarazzo. And as I recall, it wasn't the same Matarazzo, Alberto Matarazzo, it was another one in that family. And they had the most delicious cakes and desserts that you can imagine. And we always spent time there when we went to the Bronx. And every, that's all I can remember. And when we were children, little, and if we had a birthday in Woodside, my cousins and whose ever birthday was, my father took a trip to the Pasticero. We had ordered a cake and he brought back the cake. And we always had, it was a delicacy. It was, it's never been repeated. I often wonder who had those recipes and where they are today. I don't know, but it, it was a wonderful memory. What was your first language? My first language was Ladino. I spoke, as I said, my grandmother lived with us and she spoke nary a word of English. And my parents were just halfway. They spoke English, but it was difficult for them because they were educated completely in in Europe. Well, not, well, my mother went, they all went to night school here when they got to America. So they spoke a rather good English. But my first language was Ladino. So Ruth, when did you learn English? When I started kindergarten, and little by little, I didn't know too much of it, because as I said, I have to go into that story. The, the teacher asked everybody to come the next day with a dime, and they got an NRA sticker, National Year Recovery Act. You know, we're, we're talking about Roosevelt years, you understand. And I didn't have a dime because I didn't understand what she had said. And I was very upset. Everybody got a sticker, but I didn't. And my father was waiting for me outside to take me home from school. And I told him the story and I was crying. And we marched right in to the teacher together. And he gave the teacher a dime and she gave me an NRA sticker. So <laughs> and we had it on my window in the bedroom. I put it right in there. Why did you switch from speaking Ladino to speaking English as a child? Oh, that's a good question. I think, because, to be honest with you, because I was embarrassed in school and they all spoke English. And naturally, you know, they were being brought up in an in a English speaking home. And of course, mine was different. But I, I forced myself to learn how to speak English. I'm talking about five, six, seven years old, you know. I mean, I, I spoke some English because I got along and uh, that was it. I think embarrassment. I gave my all to the pure Spanish that we learned in school. And uh, I wanted to do well in that, and I did. But of course, it was very confusing at one time. Knowing Ladino and getting the language in school, many of the verbs and some of the expressions would come to mind in Ladino, and I would write it down. Of course, they were wrong, you know, it happened, I'll never be at once on a test. They asked to write the Spanish word for fork, F-O-R-K, and I wrote piron. You know, I spelled it out, P-I-R-O-N. And of course, that was Ladino. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't Spanish. Anyway, what can I tell you? Now, what I particularly love about your story is that your cousin Maurice, Maury, took you to a ball hosted by the Sephardic Brotherhood of America, La Hermandad Sephardi, who was a regular partner of our Ladino Day events. And that night would forever change your life. Tell us what you remember from that night from some 70 years ago. Oh, yes. I'd be happy to. It was a dance that they held every Sunday night at the Brotherhood. In the Brotherhood offices themselves, they had a lovely room and they would have, they would play records and they had a, a dance and uh, young 
uh, Sephardic boys and girls would meet there. And a lot of my friends that I knew from Rockaway, from the beach, the girls who lived in the Bronx, even though I lived in Queens, they were there. And I knew they were going to be there. We all were together. And I saw this young man who was (laughs) very attracted to me and I, I to him. And we danced. And his name was Albert Azaria. And and it was difficult for him dating me because at the time he didn't have a car. Later on, he did get one. He was younger. And then he I think he became of age and he had a car and he came to Queens and we dated. And that's where I met him at the Sephardic Brotherhood of America. (laughs) But it was on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. So Albert, who lived in the Bronx at that time, asked for your hand in marriage and you started your life together in Forest Hills, Queens, where you raised three children. Tell us about each of your children. Well, uh, we were married in December 1950 and we went on a wonderful honeymoon. And then when we came back, uh, Stephanie was born, my older child, in 1951. So it wasn't too long before she I became pregnant and she was born. I, and uh, she, she's a wonderful child. I adore her. She's very bright. When Stephanie was not quite two years old, when Elise was born, the same month, and uh, I came home with a new baby. And uh, Elise was a, a very outgoing little girl. She got into everybody's heart. They were that close. Thank God they're close today. And uh, nine and a half years later, almost 10 years later, Hank was born. And what can I tell you? They used to fight over the girls who would fade him and who would, who would wheel him and who would take him. And who, oh, it was wonderful. No, they were, they were so proud of him. And I was so thrilled that it was a boy. And my husband, of course, the Sephardics, I'm, I'm sure we're, you're aware of this. They, they hold tremendous... Um, what can I say, pride in having a son and carrying the name. That's very important to them. And uh, my husband was thrilled with him. I had three wonderful children. I I went to the synagogue very often in the Bronx. And then, of course, Forest Hills. They moved to Forest Hills. And uh, it was right in my neighborhood. So uh, especially before Hank was bar mitzvah, he was bar mitzvah at the the synagogue in, in Cedarhurst with uh, Rabbi Marins was uh, the uh, rabbi there, the Abixir, he was the one that gave the boys Hebrew lessons. Ruth, I remember one Ladino related story in particular that you told me about your son's role in the 1996 movie Birdcage, where he appeared alongside Robin Williams, Gene Hackman and Nathan Lane. What's the Ladino connection? Well, it was interesting because part of the dialogue was for him to say, as the character in the movie, adios. And he said, adio. And he said, the, the director, whoever it was, corrected him. And he, he said, no, my grandmother used to say, adio. And that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> he just mimicked the word. My mother, instead of saying adios mio, you know, uh, which a lot of Spanish people use that term. But he, my mother always said, adio, and, and just cut it there. And he picked that up, and that's what he used in the, in the film. Well, they wanted him to have an accent because, uh, you know, that, that was part of the, I guess, of the, of the uh, story, that he came from uh, Venezuela, I believe. And, of course, he really, but they had a Venezuelan coach on, on the set, he told me, and but he, he imitated my mother. He, he always did as a little boy, even. He had a wonderful ear for him, mimicking and uh, imitating. So that's what he did. He, he had my mother's accent for the character in that particular role. When we were speaking earlier, you mentioned a number of Ladino words and phrases. Can you explain to me and our viewers what they mean? Let's start with Secretos del Dio. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> when anything happened that was in, in my mother's estimation or my father's, it was like if the child did something outstanding, whether my mother would say, secreta del Dios, you know, del Dios, that uh, 
we don't know about it, but something God, God given. That's what it means, really. Thank you, Ruth. And how about you mentioned one earlier that said, "No me bebas la sangre." Oh, that was the, that used to. I couldn't understand literally what that meant, and of course, I realized I, I the, the connotation was embarrassment on the the adults' part, but but the words literally translated was "Don't drink my blood," and I said, "Qué quiere decir esto?" You know, mama, what does that mean? Well, you know, you take the blood away and you get upset, something. It was just an expression. But all my aunts use it too. Mira, si vas ahí, ahí, en esta casa, no me bebas la sangre, te vas a comportar. And, you know, that kind of, that was the way the connotation was. Now, Ruth, earlier, you mentioned the word fichugo a few times. Can you tell us what's a fichugo or a fichuga? Well, yes, I will. It, depending on the gender, it was a, it was a girl you were referring to was fichuja, a boy or a male. It was fichujo, but what it means was pesty, annoying, a real uh, <laughs> a real pest. You know, that's what it means. Something is, you know, if a person was overbearing and you didn't care for them, they were a fichuja or fichujo. That's it. Ruth, do your children know any Ladino words? Did they grow up learning any Ladino? Well, words? you know, Hank, Hank being such a mimic which is what he does <laughs> on The Simpsons all the time. But he did pick up, he, every so often he'll pick up something and he love, he turns it around and makes it Spanish, you know, adds an O at the end or an A. But uh, he's the only one. I, I think that uh, Stephanie at one point as a little girl, she understood a great deal. And because she spent a great time with my mother in my house, my mother spent time with us. And uh, she being the oldest, picked up. I don't know what she does about it today. She may or may not. I haven't really discussed that with her. Do you remember any songs in Ladino that your parents or grandmother sang to you or that you sang to your children? My mother sang. My mother had a beautiful voice, by the way, really a, a, a well carrying voice. I mean, she at, at, at parties, at weddings, at bar mitzvahs or whatever. She always sang. People asked her, and she she had a great voice. And oh, she loved uh, the song. Constantly sang that. Love it. The one, the dove, uh, La Paloma. She I, she carried the, the song so beautifully. And that that was one of the lullabies that she sang all the time to my children, to me. You know, whenever Mama was going to put the little one to bed, I could hear her singing. Si en tu ventana llega la paloma. Trátala con cariño, que es mi persona. Cuéntale de tus amores, bien de mi vida. Corona de flores, que es cosa mía. And the words were so beautiful. And she, of course, she sang it so beautifully. And, and how is your life in Miami? How is it like living in Miami? Do you participate? Oh, I love, I love the Sephardic area. Groups? I'm very, very, I'm very happy here. I moved down to Florida in 1981. My husband had moved down in 80, 1980, because he was, went into business here with another gentleman that he was affiliated with in New York. Ruth, who do you speak Ladino with? You. <laughs> Very few people, Brian. I wish I spoke with more people. As we finish this interview, I want to ask you, what does Ladino mean to you? Ladino to me is my childhood, my upbringing. I heard it all the time. And as I said before, if you wanted to learn and wanted to speak to grandma, you spoke Ladino. And it, there wasn't, it wasn't uh, discussed or, or even cleared up for us. You just did. And Ladino was the language. And it means there are so many things, happy days, sad days, but it's it just language and, and expressions. I guess most children, most people, most adults, they think back of their childhood and what was important to them. And that's what it means to me, my childhood, my upbringing. Great. And is there anything else you want us to know about you? Well, I have, was very fortunate in my life. I had a wonderful husband. He was a marvelous, oh, what can I say, kind, intelligent, hardworking, and a wonderful father. And I miss him. He's gone now. He passed away in uh, 2013, and uh, I miss him. But uh, I had—I was lucky. I was very fortunate. And then I had three great kids, 
thank God they were all wonderful and just let them stay healthy. And that's all I'm grateful for. And I'm grateful for my parents because they really, they were just so loving to me and to each other and the household. And what can I say? I'm grateful for that. Wonderful. Mashallah. <laughs> Gracias. To you too, mashallah. My grandmother would say mashallah whenever I came home from school with a good report card and my mother would look at the card or something and, and repeat it for my grandmother. She said, mashallah, you know, she, she, would, she would give those expressions all the time. I haven't heard that in a long time, Brian. It's good to speak to you because it's a very refreshing feeling for someone that, you know, you put these things in the back of your mind and you forget them and now you're bringing them up again. And it's very, very fascinating. It's, it's, it's satisfying and very, very entertaining to me. Ruth, thank you so much for your time and for being such a positive light in this world. Siempre es un placer. Merci muy mucho. Thank you. And to you too. And thank you for your time. It was wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Be well and be happy. And keep in touch. I love hearing from you. Merci mucho. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. It It is an absolute honor to be here today. I'll be sharing four stories with you uh, and the phrases of the stories, which is, it just lets you see how rich of a language we have. The phrase for the first story is Abediwar Almas. Abediwar Almas means save a life. It's very important in Judaism. The most important thing, the very big mitzvah commandment is to save a life. And here is the story behind this, this phrase. Una de mañana, it was in the morning of Shabbat. Dos hombres corrieron a la casa del rabino del casal. Two men ran to the house of the rabbi, the rabbi of the town. Y le dijeron, and they said to him, Señor rabino, Aham, Rabbi, se cayó un asno al pozo. There is a donkey that's fallen into a pit. ¿Cuál lo vamos a hacer? What can we do now? It's, the donkey's in the pit. How do we get him out? Y el rabino les respondió, and the rabbi responded to them, the great rabbi. Hoy es Shabbat. No se puede hacer ninguna labor. Today is Shabbat. You can't do any labor. Ma, los hombres insistieron. But the men, they insisted. Rabbi, ma, señor rabino, es el asnico suyo que se cayó al pozo. It's your donkey that fell in the pit. Sintiendo esto, el rabino, when the rabbi heard this, le respondió inmediatamente. He said to them immediately, Tienes razón. You're so right. Hay de, hay de averiguar almas. Quickly, we have to save lives. Corran presto y quiten el asnico del pozo. Run quickly and take the donkey out of the pit. Averiguar almas. It sounds a little bit like you know, a sense of religious, maybe hypocrisy. I can say that, I'm a rabbi. <laughs> that is our first story. Our second story, our second phrase, it's called, or the phrase is, la colita del ratón, the tail of the little mouse. And this is a great, great story. The story goes like this. David, vida un ratón, he le dijo a Jacko, it was David that saw a mouse, and he told Jack or Yaakov, Vidi un ratón muy grande. I saw a very big mouse con una cola de 10 centímetros with a tail that was about 10 centímetros. Jacko fue pichín a contárselo a Marco. So Jacko ran immediately to tell it over to Marco, diciéndole, and he said to him like this, Ya sabes que David vido un ratón con una cola de 30 centímetros? Did you hear? Did you know that David saw a mouse with a tail that's 30 centimeters? 
was 10, now it's 30. Sintiendo esto, when Marco heard this, se apresuró de ir on the Moshon, he ran over to Moshon, y le dijo, and he said to him, Moshon, Moshon, Jaco me contó que David vido un ratón con una cola de medio metro. Jaco told me that David saw a mouse with a tail. You know how big? It was half a meter. So, of course, it's growing. Entonces, Moshon corrió donde Alberto. So now, Moshon runs over to Alberto y le dijo, and he said to him, ¿Ya sentiste lo que contó Jaco a Marco? Did you hear what Jaco told Marco? Que David vido un ratón con una cola de un metro? That David saw a mouse with a tail as long as a meter, an entire meter. Y en sí, del uno al otro, la colica del ratón se alargó hasta tres metros. And this way, the tail of the mouse got bigger and bigger until it was three meters. Por esto, si nos parece que uno está escallereando en el contar alguna cosa, that's why when we think that somebody is telling a story and is making things too big, y no queremos decírselo abiertamente and we don't want to tell him openly. We just want to hint it to him. Le decimos, le decimos en remes, so we say it in a hint. Ah, la colica del ratón. Right? You're exaggerating the story. Right? So this is la colica del ratón. That's our second story, our second phrase. We come into our third one. And the third phrase is bamia chuflete, an okra and a whistle. And this is a cute, cute story. The story goes like this, behind the phrase, the story goes like this. Al tiempo había en Izmir un grande mercader de Zarzava. There was en Izmir, there was a great, he was a merchant that he used to deal with vegetables, fruits. Que vendía fuera de Turquía y hacía hecho con el Cairo. So he used to export some of his products out of Turkey into, into Cairo, into Egypt. Un buen día, one day, cuando era tiempo de trufanda. So it was the time that, you know, the fruits of the season are coming, are beginning to come out. Le telegrafaron de allá. So, so from, the, from Cairo, they sent them a telegraph. This is before email, right? So demandándole los precios de los azabates. So they were asking him for the price, prices of the vegetables. Very well. Este mercader tenía un empleado. So the merchant, he had an employee. Lo llamó y le dijo, he called them over and he told them, escribe. Le dijo, write the following. He said to him, write the following, right? Precio de fasulia. The price for the beans. 20 groches. It's 20 groches. We'd say cents, right? It's... Precio de tomate, the price of the tomato, 30, it's 30. Precio de berenjena, the price of the eggplant, 40, it's 40, the price of the eggplant, right? Precio de la calabazica, the price of the pumpkin, pumpkin, 50, it's 50. Y el empleado estaba escribiendo, and the em em employee kept on writing everything that the owner, the boss, kept on telling him to prepare to send over the telegraph with all of this information. Cuando el patrón escapó la lista, when the boss ended the list of all of the vegetables that they were, on the they, they were preparing for the telegraph, le demandó al empleado, he, he asked, el empleado le demandó, the, the, the worker asked him, ¿Y precio de bamia? What's the price for the bamia? How much, how much is the bamia, the okra? So, bamia? The balabai, right? The owner, the boss said, Dicho el patrón y echó un chuflete, right? When he told them, asked them about the bamia, he said, Bamia, that's a chuflete, right? He whistled. It's like it's expensive. El empleado escribió todo y mandó el telegrafo, el telegrafo, right? So the, the employee wrote everything down and he sent over the, the telegraph. Pasaron dos días, two days later, y vino la demanda del Cairo. And the response from Cairo came back. 
con todo lo que querían de allá, with everything that they wanted. Solo el del Cairo está demandando, but the man from, the, from Cairo is asking, precio de Bamia no mitites, the price for the Bamia, for the okra, you did not put it in. ¿Qué quiere decir Bamia chuflete? What does it mean when you wrote Bamia, okra, whistle, chuflete? He doesn't understand. Se maravilló el patrón. So the boss was like shocked a little bit. Llamó al empleado y le demandó. He called over the employee and he asked him, ¿Cuál es que escribiste por la Bamia? What did you write? An or for the price of the Bamia, of the okra. Y el empleado le respondió, and the worker responded, cuando te demandí el precio de la Bamia, when you asked for the price of the Bamia, of the okra, echate un chuflete, you whistle. Y yo escribí Bamia chuflete, and I wrote Bamia chuflete, Bamia. <laughs> ah, bobo. You're a fool, le dijo el patrón, the boss said to him. Ya es verdad que la bamia está muy cara. It's true that the okra, the bamia, is really expensive. Manoa está este grado, but not that much. Y ahora manda presto un otro telégrafo, con, telégrafo con el precio de la bamia, and so sent back another telegraph with the right price of the bamia. Y de aquel día... And from that day onwards, se usa la expresión, the expression became Bamia Shuflete para lavar a la Bamia. Every time that the Bamia is really good, people say Bamia Shuflete. <laughs> This became a saying. And it's just one, wonderful, right? Wonderful, wonderful how the language develops. And you see that this is the language of community when we all know something Right, the source of the words, where they're coming from, where the phrase is coming from. Now we got the fourth one, which is also a beautiful, beautiful story. And it really says so much. La paciencia del papuchi. This is, that's the phrase. The patience of the shoemaker. And the story goes like this. Un papuchi tenía una butica para adobar chapines. There was a shoemaker that had a store where he used to fix shoes al lado de una mishkita, just right next to a mosque. Un día, pasó por ahí un extranjero. One day, a stranger walked by, que vido a la entrada de la mishkita muchos pares de chapines, viejos y nuevos mezclados. He walked by, and he sees next to the mosque all these shoes, new, old, they're all mixed, they're all laying around there. Y quiso saber de... De qué estaban allá? And he wanted to know, why are all these shoes laying around here? Entró a la butica del papuchi. Right, so the logic, right? He goes into the store of the papuchi, right? Of the, of the shoemaker. Entró a la butica del papuchi, le demandó, and he asked him, ¿De qué hay chapines aquí afuera? What, why, why are all these shoes out here? See that connection, right? Y el papuchi le respondió, and the shoemaker responded to him, no sé, <laughs> I don't know. That's very interesting, right? The shoemaker, all the shoes out there, he sees the shoes, he walks in, the stranger walks in, asks him, and the papuchi, the shoemaker, doesn't know what the shoes are there for. Salió el extranjero de la butica, so the stranger walked out of the store. Hizo la misma demanda a los vecinos de al lado, so he asked The same question to the neighbors that were around the store, around the mosque. Y ellos le respondieron, and they were able to give him an answer. Estos chapines son de los turcos que entran en la mishkita. These shoes are from the Turks, right? It's the Muslims, right? That they take off the shoes when they enter the mosque. That's the religious practice. Para hacer sus oraciones in order to do their prayers. Y se quitan los si los quitan antes de entrar, and they take them off before they go in, right? So that's the answer. Voltó el extranjero a la butica del papuchi y le demandó. So now, the stranger went back to the store of the shoemaker, and he asked him, 
¿Sos nuevo de aquí? Are you new in this area? ¿De cuánto tiempo tienes esta boutique? How many, how long have you had this store? Y él le respondió, and he answered, hay 30 años que estoy aquí. It's 30 years that I'm here. Entonces, el otro le demandó, so the stranger asked him, ¿Y no te interesates nunca por saber cuál están haciendo aquí todos estos pares de chapines? And you never, ever were interested in finding out what are all these shoes doing out here? No, le respondió el papuchí. The answer of the papuchí was, no, I was never, I never really wondered. Le vino Hushuna al extranjero, so the stranger was amused. Y le dijo, Buena paciencia de Papuchi. And he said to him, well, this is the patience of the shoemaker. Y así quedó la dicha. And this is how the saying remained. Paciencia de Papuchi hasta nuestros días. The patience of the Papuchi. Right? When somebody is really patient, that's what we say. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here with you. Sanos y recios. <music> Hundreds, if not thousands of people took to their computers to learn Ladino in 2020. Today, you'll meet just three of these dedicated students. So let's start with our first question. There are thousands of languages and dialects in the world. What made you want to study Ladino? We'll start with Zach. I started to study Ladino after a DNA test. My father, my father was adopted at birth by an Ashkenazi family, and we never knew who his biological family was. And after taking an ancestry test and doing some detective work, I discovered that my family had come to New York um, from mostly from Gallipoli. And I tracked down a distant cousin of mine, uh, Mar Martin Alvo, uh, he's about, I think he's probably about 92 years old. And uh, we spoke on the phone and he spoke to me in this very unusual Spanish that I had never heard before. And it piqued my curiosity and I really started looking into it. And uh, one thing led to another and I found, I found you, Brian, actually. And that's how I started studying. Wonderful. Wonderful. Lexi, how about you? Lexi Muncha Brian, yo soy Lexi y moro in Toronto. I'm Lexi and I live in Toronto. Latino has always been part of my life and my family history. When my family was expelled from Spain during the Spanish Inquisition, which began in the 1400s, they fled to Turkey and to Greece, where they stayed for about 500 years, continuing to speak this version of Spanish, infusing it with their local languages such as Turkish, Greek, French, Italian, and Hebrew, and the list goes on. And over 600 years later, my grandparents continue to speak Ladino, uh, and I wanted to study it to continue the tradition. It was the first language of my grandfather, Victor, who's watching today, when he lived in the Congo, and he was at boarding school, he would write letters, which I've read, uh, to his parents in Ladino. And my grandmother, Belina, also watching from Johannesburg, she learned to speak Ladino later in her childhood. And I always found it incredible that a language that had survived hundreds of years throughout generations um, was being spoken by my grandparents. Thank you, Lexi. And one of the wonderful things is that Lexi was able to take the class um, with her mother. And that's something we're seeing that's quite common, families coming together to learn languages across uh, Ladino, across generations. And what about you, Matt? So for me, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my connection to Ladino is really through music. Um, I, I fell in love with uh, Judy Frankel's songs and Ramon Tassat. And when I was in college, I actually choreographed a Sephardic folk dance for the Latino um, cultural event on campus. And it was through that that I really became connected to the language. And I was a Spanish major, so it was really interesting to see this other variety of Spanish. And, uh, and then of course to learn with you, Brian, was just amazing because we were in this dark moment uh, as, as a civilization uh, and just to have this connection to our ancient heritage, Jewish heritage, uh, but really a universal heritage for me was just so special and gave me hope. Um, because if we, if Sephardic 
Jews had over, overcome so many obstacles to get to where they are today, um, I felt like all of us had that opportunity. Great. And, and several of you are continuing to study Ladina with me or with some of the um, other amazing professors and instructors around the world. So thank you. Let's move to our next question. You have been introduced to many words, sayings, phrases, and certainly songs in Ladino. What is one word, one saying, and one song in Ladino that are among your favorites? Uh, let's start with you, Zach. So one word that I like in Ladino is mazaloso. And I like, I like this word uh, because it takes a word from another language, mazal, and it slaps on that Ladino Spanish ending to create to create a new word. And I, those are those are kind of my favorite words where you can see the the etymological mishmash. Um, favorite expression, I I would say la paciencia es paz y ciencia. And I like that expression. The patience is peace and science. And uh, there's actually a few variations of that expression, but that's the one that I, that I chose. And I think it's true. I think that for patients, we do need peace, but it's also kind of a science. Um, and for music, uh, I discovered uh, an interesting musician named uh, Jaco El Musicante, who's actually a, a Spanish musician who sort of fell in love with Ladino and uh, sort of the, the Eastern musical scales uh, that we might find in, uh, in Turkey and recorded an album as this kind of character, Jaco El Musicante. And it's really fun, festive uh, music. Great, great. How about you, Lexi? So my one word would be pashiriko. It's a term of endearment, meaning little bird. You could say pashiriko uh, mio, which means my little bird. And I think it's just a precious way to, to call someone uh, a, a term of endearment. So that would be my favorite word. My favorite saying uh, or my favorite phrase is a little spicy, I think. It goes, <laughs> si tu sos ajo, yo so piedra que te majo. So it means if you are garlic, I'm the stone that will crush you. It's a little intense, but I think it's a really great example of how creative the language is and um, how entertaining it can be. And then for my favorite song, I would say Bendigamos. It's a hymn sung after meals, typically on Shabbat, the Sabbath, uh, according to the custom of Spanish Jews and Jews of Turkish descent, like my family. The song is typically associated with Spanish more than Ladino, but it still belongs to the Western Sephardic communities. And it has a really beautiful meaning, uh, which I love to sing with my family. Lexi, can I maybe ask you to sing a few verses? <laughs> sure, I, I could sing the first verse. Uh, so it goes, Bendigamos al Altisimo al Señor que nos creó Demosle agradecimiento por los bienes que nos dio. It means, let us bless the Most High, the God who created us. Let us give thanks for the good things which he gave to us. Thank you, Lexi. And Matt. Yes. So um, my favorite word is kind of a mundane word, but I just like the way it sounds. Is scalerica. Uh, which means ladder. There's also a song, Scalerica de Oro, uh, a ladder of gold. Um, my favorite uh, expression is actually how Brian uh, signs off a lot of his emails, which is sanos y resios que estés. May you all be healthy and strong, um, which I think is what we need right now. Um, and my favorite song is Cuando el Rey Nimrod, sometimes known as Avram Avinu. Great. And Matt, you know, whenever there was any technological issue in our class, which we all know we had happened on Zoom, Matt just burst into song. So Matt, gracias al Leo, there are no technological issues right now, but do you want to also give us a few verses of that song? Sure. Cuando el rey Nimrod al campo salía, miraba en el cielo y en la estrellería, dido luz santa en la judería, que había de nacer, Abraham vino. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. 
Thank you so much. Bendita vos. Wonderful. Um, the next question will be a little bit personalized. So I'll start with you, Zach. You are a teacher of English, French, and Spanish, and a student of Ladino. What has it been like learning an endangered yet living language online in Spain? And has your experience learning Ladino taught you anything about your own teaching? It's It's been really, really enriching for me. I think because this has been a, a tough period socially, um, it's been wonderful feeling like part of an of a community and coming into contact with people really all over the world, South America, Turkey, Israel, Europe, everywhere, North America, of course. Um, so that's been, that's been really special. And also working with really amazing teachers, really amazing teachers. I've had uh, five different Ladino teachers and all of them have an incredible depth of knowledge and a real uh, passion. And as a language teacher, as someone who's been teaching English for more than 10 years, it's easy to get complacent. And to see my teachers teach with such passion, um, that kind of woke me up a little bit. And uh, so that's been important for me as a teacher. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> Lexi, in your case, Ladino isn't a language that you recently discovered. It's one that you mentioned you, know, you grew up with, uh, one that has traveled with you from childhood in Johannesburg, South Africa, to your young adulthood in Toronto, Canada. What's it like reclaiming a language that your family has spoken for generations? It's been a true blessing and a privilege. When I learn Ladino, I feel connected to hundreds of generations of tradition, and it brings so much more meaning, I think, to the traditions that I have today. It gives meaning and purpose, for example, to the blessing that my mother gives me every Friday night. She says to me, Novia que te vegamos, that I see you be married, y ya de buena ventura, that you have a good reputation, and más al alto que tengas that you always have luck. And one that my grandparents add, which is reushita buena, that you be successful. And I know that 2020 has been a difficult year for many reasons, but Ladino for me was definitely a, a silver lining. The months of classes I was able to take with you, Brian, was sparked really by our move to Zoom online. And I would never have been able to reclaim the language for myself without the help of technology and uh, an exceptional teacher. So I'm really thankful uh, to you, Brian, and, and the Spartan communities who are the ones keeping this really beautiful and rich language alive. Wonderful. Thank you. And Matt, aside from English and Ladino, you speak and have studied many languages, including Arabic, Hebrew, Spanish, Portuguese, Catalan, French, and Yiddish. And aside from the common phrase in Ladino, un marafet en cada dedo, right? a skillful person or literally a skill in each finger, we can just about say for you, una lingua en cada dedo, right? Just a language for every finger in your case. But what stands out to you most about Ladino? I think um, what stands out to me about Ladino is that it, I really have a passion for minority languages and I think, um, and my Jewish heritage, and it kind of fuses those two things. So for me, you know, I had a Catalan teacher once who told me, <clears throat> excuse me, every language is a source of richness. <clears throat> Don't worry, I'm healthy. Um, uh, but every language is a source of richness. And I think that that definitely applies to Ladino, the fusing of so many different of the other languages that I speak into this one language made it so appealing to learn. Um, so I get so excited when I see a Turkish word of, of Arabic origin, you know, popping into Ladino. It just, it's just so exciting to see that, that richness at work. Um, and I think that's what makes it so special. Excellent. Um, our final question. 2020 was quite the year for Ladino resulting in articles like why Ladino will rise again and why Zoom means boom time for Ladino. But what will 2021 bring? Where does your Ladino journey go from here? Zach? I have a, I have a few Ladino related things that I want to do. And the first one is uh, I want to read a book 
that I that I ordered last week. The mail's a little backed up here in Spain with the holiday season, so I'm still waiting on it. Uh, but it's Devin Devin Nar's book, Professor Devin Nar's book um, about Jewish Salonika between the Ottoman Empire and modern Greece. So I'd like to travel as well. I'd love to. I'd love to to visit some ancestral land in Turkey. But first up is reading a book. Wonderful. A great book at that. Um, Lexi. So in 2021, I'm hoping to my continue my classes in Ladino. It takes a lot of work and practice. And ultimately, I'm, I'm hoping to gain the ability to speak comfortably and have a casual conversation. And then last year, I was also meant to be married in the island of Rhodos in Greece, which was one of the most well-known Latino-speaking Jewish centers prior to the Holocaust. And for 2021, I'm hoping to be married in the synagogue that my great-grandparents went to in the 1920s. 100 years ago, and to have Ladino present in our celebration. Beautiful. Thank you. And Matt? Um, so I, there are two things. One is that I'm really connected to Catalonia and to the Catalan Jewish experience, um, and I've done some reading about it, and I'm really interested in connecting um, you know, Sephardic with Sephardic heritage from Catalonia. Um, and I think there's a real thirst for knowledge about Judaism in that part of Spain um, or not part of Spain, depending on how you see things. Um, uh, but I think that, that that's something that really interests me is, is using, using my knowledge of the Sephardic world and connecting with Jewish communities there. Um, and my other thing is, uh, yeah, I want to learn more music um, and more songs. So I'm definitely open to suggestions and, and uh, new artists. But I think uh, this Sephardic song just brings so much joy to my life. Do all the grandparents on earth speak with such strange twists and turns? Esther Benaroya grew up enveloped in that Spanish, intermingled with words from other worlds. Judeo-Spanish was not the language of her studies, but it was the language she heard from her parents and grandparents. Later, she came to speak it far away. A donde arrapan al huerco, México. México era para nosotros, en la carta, solo un país que de la banda izquierda le encolgaba una lengua con el nombre de la Baja California. At the godforsaken ends of the earth, Mexico? Mexico was, for us, on the map, just a country with a long tongue hanging off its left side called Baja California. A short time after her arrival, Esther Benaroya, my paternal grandmother, decided to go to Sears, the department store blossoming right there before her eyes, agitated by neon lights. She needed to buy hairpins to placate her curls. She went up the escalator with a fear that no one seemed to notice. She headed toward the second floor, and very sure of what she was looking for, she approached the clerk. Señorita, quiero mercar unas firquetas para los cabellos. Señorita, I would like to buy some hairpins for my hair. Some what? Trocas, firquetas, bobby pins, hairpins. The employee isn't able to comprehend. Some weeks later, she, Esther Benaroya, had learned the word chingada, messed up, and then chingadera, worthless things, though she preferred the diminutive chingaderica, worthless little things. So then she corrected herself. Quedo unas chingadericas, bre. I would like some worthless little things, bre. The employee blushed and shot off to find the manager. Estelle Benaroya left with a cardboard packet filled with hairpins with gummed tips. It made her happy to infuriate people. She'd been told before that the word chingadera is impolite in this country, but she can't be bothered by that. It's her way of saying, Agora hablo vuestro español como lo hablas vosotros en la España y en México. Now I speak your Spanish, like you speak it in Spain and Mexico. Some people were scandalized, while others ignored her or chuckled at her wackiness. 
before she arrived in Mexico, all she could say was that it was a faraway country where people wore cowboy chapeos, hats, and ate excessively spicy foods. Dice el marido mío que los mostachos le quedan quemando después de estas comidas de fuegos. My husband says his mustache always burns after he eats these fiery foods. When she came ashore in these lands, she thought for a moment that all Mexicans had Jewish blood. They all spoke Spanish, that language of the Sephardim from Turkey and Bulgaria. Aquí lo hablan malo, malo, malo. No saben decir las cosas con su música de origen. But here they speak it very poorly. They don't know how to say things with the music of their origins. This is the beginning of my book, Tela de Cebolla, Onion Cloth. Uh, since my childhood, but especially since I started writing poetry, Ladino resonates in me, a language that I heard through my childhood. I have enjoyed the charm of being lulled in that and old sweet Spanish that I always heard in my everyday life, but never spoke. As a child, I got used to hearing the idioms in which my grandmothers expressed themselves. For years, I thought that what I heard was a language of the old, that all the grandparents of the earth spoke that strange Spanish, Spanish interwained with words from other worlds. As part of a Sephardic Bulgarian family that took root in Mexico in the post-war period, I lived as represented by Chinese boxes or Russian dolls in a reality contained within others. At home, cooking was done with species from different geographies, a rice tooth or grape leaf that appear in the Old Testament alternated with cuvette recipes from Bulgarian cuisine or with mole poblano, this stew from Puebla, typical of the Mexican gastronomy. Thus, in the fire of the burners, there was a mixture, as if our kitchen were the United Nations. I used to think that this fusion in which I lived was natural. Although knowledge during childhood touches our senses before our intellect, I learn move amidst the custom of various, various cultures. I am grateful for that destiny. Uh, I lost my parents early. The debt towards the Judeo-Spanish legacy I inherit becomes a declaration of love for what I have lost as if what I have in my hands were the possibility of reconstructing something that sleeps under oblivion, something whose awakening would be scary. It has taken me a while to steer what was in me, even before the words, these palabricas, little words, or dulces viervos, sweet words, in which I have found pleasure, shelter, and a form of drifting away, a sensation that I did not take into, into account during the years in which I only hovered above them, fearful, but also immensely yearning to touch the words from within. I claim that with a language rooted in the 16th century, monographs on contemporary science or experimental poetry can be written. A language is not sustained by a decree, but by its speakers and the literature that represent it. Ladino, a language that no children anywhere in the world speak, and I say this conscious that I may sound as a bird of ill omen, is in danger, just like a species. Caught against such a horizon, the exercise of literary expression will not only preserve the memory of the language wealth. And my own question arises. Can contemporary poetry be written in the archaic forms of 500 years ago? Hopefully the answers can be contained in the poems I have written so far in Judesmo, and not only in theoretical commentaries. 
The truth is that as contemporary as a creative proposal may be in that language, it will always include phrases used in the poetry of the golden age, as well as old lost expressions or transformed into today's Spanish. All this is part of a kind of spell cast on me when I write in the language of my ancestors. I can't explain why, but for me, the word sequence in Ladino is a musical scale. Using oral expressions and idioms of Ladino makes me ponder on the veracity of a Chinese proverb, which is also the expression of a poetic truth. The bird does not sing because it has an answer. It sings because it has a song. Writing in Ladino is an explosion or outburst that need to be invented. How do you say cellular physiology, excuse me for my horrible accent. How do you designate cinema or virtual communication? Those who write in Judesmo have to deal with these questions and to be sure they face new, question, new questions coming from the answers. As a natural speaker of Spanish, my mother tongue that however, was not the first language of my parents, my daily life swings over the century that oscillates between Ladino and Spanish. I published Ancina, a poetry book written 100% in Ladino with the absolute awareness that those who would read it would only be those who find pleasure in the light and shadow of Spanish. My ties with Ladino are more anchored to the love for the childhood of my language than to the love for the language of my childhood. I don't know if there is any another language that enjoys the privilege of having another one behind, behind it, whose use allows a speaker to travel in a time mas machine. Spanish has it as if through Judeo-Spanish, the language could be glimpsed in its child state. Since the most recent earthquake in Mexico City on September 19, 2017, I had to abandon my home, an apartment in the beautiful neighborhood of Condesa in Mexico City, since then, my life is a constant move. The building suffers structural damage. It was demolished. And as I am writing these words, it is likely, likely that we can only talk about its debris. Bless the one who lost her home because she can always be dreaming about it, wrote the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova. For almost two years after the earthquake, I had access to my place. There was my library, and if I need a book or a document, I could go home and take it. That idol was over just a few months ago. For 40 days under proverbial nights, I dedicated myself to packing, dismantling, putting together, throwing away papers, and purging that unmanageable library, returning to photographs, documents, contracts, many of them unusual. In that chaos, I opened a box full of letters. Without any order, they were in front of me, paled up, message of old love, of friends who no longer, who no longer exist, official literary family letters. Suddenly, I found a letter from my brother, dated in March 1977, three months after my mother's death. I had fled to Israel where a brothers of hers still lived in Yafo. I wanted to get away from mourning, even if I took it with me. In that letter, my brother told me that the house remained the same, our house, that he was almost never there, that he only used it for sleeping. And I caught a passage from memory. Last night, I opened the kitchen drawer with potatoes, garlic, and onions were stored. Do you remember? 
onions grew new roots and leaves. I was impressed and I started thinking about everything you and I have to do now to overcome, to move forward. Yes, we were alone. I was then 20 years old. My father had died in our early childhood. Reading that fragment shook me. That paragraph had remained in me, albeit not consciously. Those old onions growing anew that I didn't remember during the years I wrote my novel, Onion Cloth, Tela de Cebolla, appeared a few months ago to reveal something about our nat nature that I did not know. Now I convinced that the cebolla onion of my title exceeds, exceeds the allusion to the proverb in Judesmo, el meollo del hombre es tela de cebolla. The human mankind is like onion cloths. For me to write in Judeo Spanish is a delight and it's a challenge. Today, there is no Ladino dictionary that has the last word. This undoubtedly creates a babel of signs and also a charm that Judeo Spanish shares with few languages. It is logical that this condition represents a difficulty to, to contemporary writers who decide to write in Judeo Spanish, but it also opens up a space for, a space for inventiveness. Ladino is a homeless language and until recently without an academy. I don't know if uh, the small examples which I have illustrated this talk express the reasons of my love, absolutely love for Ladino. And although I don't want to become the official writer of Judeo-Spanish, I know I will always have a foot in this world and of which I am an involuntary and grateful heiress. When I want to explain the reasons for writing in this language, I think of the image of a torch lit for centuries that each generation is concerned with keeping burning, as in the Olympic Games. The sensation of having received from my elders that ancient fire that is going out in my hands fuels my need to do something, however modest, by writing in Judeo-Spanish now in the 21st century with the tongue is strongly, when the tongue is struggling among us as some of the native languages of Mexico and the world for the miracle of his lights. Canticas. Songs. Me topo con una ciudad, me recodro que ahí moraban mis dos madres, y mojo los pieses en los ríos que de unas y otrunas aguas arriban al lugar. Y a mis dos madres siento hablar, en distintas canticas hablan las dos. Les miro los suyos hoyos y les peino los sus cabellos castaños y separo los sus cabellos blancos de los sus cabellos pretos. Las dos madres ríen por todo cuando, por todo cual lo hablo con ellas. I come upon a city. I remember that there lived my two mothers. I come up, I come upon a city. I remember and I wet my feet in the rivers that from these and other waters arrive to this place. And my two mothers I hear them speak. In different canticas, they both speak. I look at them in their eyes and I comb their hair that is brown and I separate their hair that is white from the hair that it is dark. My two mothers laugh at everything I say to them. Thank you.
afternoon almost good evening up here from the Catskills the sun is shining and um, setting uh, we're so excited to be here with all of you after this beautiful program to conclude uh, Ladino Day 2021 this is my husband and partner Daniel Friedman percussionist Daniel Friedman we started with um, the piute Enke Loheinu Non Como Muestro Dio with melodies based on two uh, two diasporas, Morocco and Belgrade, as we have been performing it or uh, praying it actually in uh, through Piyut North America, which I worked with as Manale Piyut in Israel and Piyut North America and BJ, where we explored Piyut team from the different diasporas. Our next song is El Rey de Francia. Um, and it is a beautiful romance huh? that um, I'm gonna tell you the, the, the words to it. And there is the word pasharikos in it, the small little birds. Um, so the king of France had three daughters, one of them embroidered and the other one sawed. sawed. The youngest uh, one was making tapestry and while working, she fell asleep. Her mother seeing this wanted to speak to her and the daughter answered, don't speak to me, mother. Don't interrupt me. I was in the middle of a very happy dream. You were having a dream, I will explain to you. 
At the door, I saw the full moon appear before me. At the window, I saw the star appear before me. At the well, I saw a golden bowl or a golden pillar appear before me with three little birds pecking on the gold. The full moon is your mother-in-law. The star is your sister-in-law. The three little birds are your brother-in-law. And the golden bowl or the golden pillar is the king's son, your husband. El rey de Francia, tres hijos tenía, la una la brava y la otra cosía, la más chica de ellas, bastidor. this melody to sing Lechadodi. So if you know Lechadodi, please join us. You heard the melody so many times. It goes like this. Lechadodi likrat kala pnei shabbat nekabla Lechadodi likrat kala Shabbat nekabla Shamor vezachor bedibur echad Hishmianu el amyuchad Adonai echad ushmo echad Leshem ultiferet veleteila Shabbat 
Thank you. Our next song is more of the silly ones, silly words. Ija mia mi querida. Oh, my dear daughter, it's time for you to get married. May I suggest few men? How about the handsome one? No, oh, no, no, I do not want the handsome, handsome man. How about the tall one? No, I can't reach him. How about the one with the dandruff? No, he doesn't have a brain. So the, the, the mother goes through many, many, uh, many, many candidates. At the end, she's at the end of her, of her list and she says, how about the borracho? How about the drunk man? And guess what? The, the, the daughter is delighted and says, yes, that's the one I would like to marry. Ija mia mi querida. Um, this is a, a Turkish song, a Turkish melody based on it. You'll see my, my version might be a little different than you uh, might know it. Um, but, or if you don't know it, it's always a good one to dance and clap around. So much we're gonna play for you just if you're already in maybe hopefully dancing or clapping uh, these are our two last uh, tunes instrumental tunes you might know these melodies uh, the coplas de purim and a la una yo nasi uh, famous uh, ladino song so hope you're enjoying it
We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.